Dr. Hay. Thank you so much for, for joining me on the podcast. I'm happy to have you on. Yeah, I'm excited to be here and to help your audience. Definitely. So why don't you give us a little explanation of your background and, and how you ended up here today? Sure. Um, where I'm at is I'm a clinical and sports psychologist. So basically what that means is I help athletes and other high performers. I've worked with actors, entrepreneurs, businessmen and women, uh, musicians, uh, overcome their obstacles to excellence. I've got a specialty in performance anxiety. So what I really help people is like those self-limiting beliefs, uh, fear of making a mistake, the things that tend to paralyze you and keep you stuck. Um, I help them, you know, develop that mindset and that emotional willingness, which I'm sure we're going to get into, uh, because a lot of this anxiety is normal, but I help people really kind of understand what the value and the purpose is and all that crap that you say in your head, um, how to interact with it differently and get past it so that you can actually achieve your dreams. Um, so I'm blessed to do it. I've been doing it for over 20 years um, and excited to be here and again, share some of this knowledge with your listeners. That's amazing. We can go straight into it then because performance <laughs> anxiety sort of was my main limiting uh, factor before starting my journey. And um, it's something that I want to help other people with. So, um, you know, is, is there something you can share, something that you can, something actionable that somebody could do today to sort of, to, to start working on that performance anxiety or just, I mean, there's anxiety and then there's performance anxiety. So maybe yeah. you can clarify that too. Yeah, well, well, thanks for just giving me the open ro uh, open door here. Um, and I especially love that you're asking for something practical because that's what you're going to get in this podcast here today is I very much, especially working with athletes, it's like, okay, we can understand all of this stuff, but if you don't tell me what to do, <laughs> what, what, what good is it? The first thing that I would love people to realize is the value and the purpose of the anxiety. And I'm not saying this to turn it around into something positive. In fact, we'll get to it, I'm sure, a little bit later that I'm actually not against positive thinking, but I know that it can actually be very toxic and I know it can actually hurt performance. And I know for a fact that it, it increases anxiety. So the first thing, well, what kind of anxiety are we talking about? Well, this performance anxiety is gonna, and any anxiety is going to go on a range. It's a completely healthy and normal emotion on one end. And then it can become terribly pathological in the sense of it can disable lives with panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, things of that nature. So Anyone who's listening, I'm not meaning to minimize if you have on those extreme ends. So maybe this message is, it, now what I'm going to tell you is going to help on those extreme ends too, but particularly the people who feel like, wow, this anxiety, maybe it's not diagnosable, but it's certainly limiting me. Again, this is where a lot of the performance anxiety lives. Every athlete that I've ever worked with, whether they're doing well or not, has some element of performance anxiety because of, again, how normal it is. So uh, Andres, let me ask you, we have... Scientists found that we've got only four basic human emotions. We used to think we had a whole bunch, you know, then we narrowed it down to six or seven. But most recent research with some really smart people doing studies, looking at facial recognition across all cultures have found that we have four basic biological human emotions. Please guess, what do you think they are? That sounds so little. I would, I would have expected much more than four. Um, probably love, happiness. Anger and I feel like I feel like you're gonna say anxiety is one of them. <laughs> so yes, I bet <laughs> that's really the punchline of it. But but yeah, and so actually the research. I mean, love. I was a little confused too because I'm like, yeah, love is qualitatively different, but they kind of grouped it all into this one big, like they're related. Love's really related with happy. So it's happy, sad, mad and scared. And you can feel like, okay, yeah, those are four qualitatively different emotions, not a lot of overlap. And that's, I think, how they reduced it. But the point is, how many of those are positive? How many of those feel good? Two or Oh, only one of them. Wow. One. Yeah, I'm like, two. I'm like, which one do you enjoy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one. So with all my high performers, for all of those listening out there, we, we got to start here. We live in a world that that tells us that 75% of what it feels to be human is problematic or we're broken. I know when I'm sad, people tell me to cheer up. When I'm angry, they tell me to calm down. And when I'm scared, they reassure me, no matter how dangerous you know, things are. And I think that's problematic. We expect people to live in 25% of what it means to be human. 75% of the potential things that I could feel suck and are unpleasant. 
Now, it doesn't mean that they're bad or broken or wrong. I just mean that they're unpleasant, but they serve great purpose. Anger, we have plenty to be angry about. Things in this world go wrong. You're entitled to be angry. Now, you're not entitled to start riots and, and react to it in a negative way. That's a completely different story. But the actual presence of, ang of anger makes sense. And when we use it and interact with it properly, it energizes us to do the things that we need to do to change. Sadness. Similar. I had to really research this one. I'm like, well, what's the benefit of sadness? Because it slows me down. and so Well, when you have a loss, it does slow you down. It gives you time and space to heal and, and let the stress of it to recover. It also signals the other side of love. Like if I lose somebody in my life or even in sports, if I lose a game and I'm sad, I had a parent bring a kid in and be like, he's so upset after games. You know, can you help him? And I'm like, no, he should be upset. He just lost the game. Like, what do you want to do? Take away his athletic you know, love? Like we only get upset about the things that are close. And it's a signal that I've lost something of great value. If I lose that game and I'm upset, it's not a problem. I'm going to be darn motivated to work harder to be sure that doesn't happen again. It's how we respond to it. And anxiety. Anxiety kept me alive. It keeps all of us alive. It, it tells us what we don't want to go wrong. And so if I wasn't worried about failing, I wouldn't have studied in school. If I'm not worried about my, my performance. I wouldn't prepare. So it's not unhealthy or problematic emotions. Now, again, I hear you. It gets in the way. Just because it's normal and natural doesn't mean that it's always helpful at the higher levels. But at a primitive level, just letting our biology do what it does, we've got a mind that looks out, particularly in the areas that we care the most about. We'll get back to that in a second. But we're going to look out and see what's dangerous. Now, if I am really starting up a business, and I really care about it, and I've invested a lot of money, I don't know what's going to happen. Anybody that's going to tell you, just be confident and go with it, run away. That's dumb. Because you have better be sure that you see the, the threats that are out there and you respect them and you respond to that anxiety with, well, what am I going to do about it to protect myself? I'm not having an anxiety problem. I'm being realistic that this is hard to do. So the first practical strategy to, uh, before I keep going on this rant here, but the first practical strategy really is to kind of make peace with the idea and you have to emotionally accept that if you're going to start a business, if you're going to do a sport, if you're going to love another human being, there's going to be unpleasant feelings that go along with it. Primary among them is going to be anxiety telling you what could go wrong because, and this is again, more so in the areas that you care the most about, because if I care and it doesn't work, it's going to hurt me more. Therefore, my biological drive is to worry more about it because it's a bigger threat, not because it's actually more dangerous, but because I care more about it. So it'll hurt me more if I don't get it. This is why I've got a practice of professional athletes, the highest level athletes trying to win state and national and international championships. Shouldn't I be working with the athletes that really suck and have a greater chance of making a mistake? But I don't. My caseload is filled with the highest achievers in business and music. The ones that have the most talent and the highest levels of production. But they sometimes can have the highest levels of anxiety as a reflection of how much they care. So my friends listening, it still is uncomfortable. I'm not here to make you feel better. But I am here on this podcast to help you perform better. And step one is to lean into that anxiety and be like, yeah, you know what? I've got every right to be scared here. So now what's important now? I want to win. W-I-N. What's important now? What do I need to do? And bring that anxiety with me and take action in that step that prepares me. And I'll pause here because that's been a good 10 minutes. <laughs> so you're basically saying that anxiety is inevitable. Yes. Is that I, yeah, it's 25% of what it means to be human. You will be anxious. But there is a space, I would say, between an emotion and an action, correct? Yes. And if you feel something, it doesn't mean you need to automatically react to that emotion, right? You can be a, a conscious person and, and choose how you react to that emotion. Uh, nevertheless, I guess that emotion, and maybe this is what you're getting at, can, uh, can be a signal to you of what direction you need to go or just, um, I would say maybe like, uh, 
people often say like, okay, your gut feeling, uh, I mean, that, that has a source, right? And your emotions can feed or create that gut feeling. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, Andres, you're, you're, you're doing a beautiful job here of, of taking that next step. Again, I'm not going to be able to cure all of this in a 15-minute you know, explanation. We want to respect that in the same way that you know, athletes will get into physical shape and they've got to train their whole career and they drill. You know, I work with them to also train their mind and their emotions. So these are skills that we'll build. And you did a beautiful job of like, once you kind of get settled into that idea that, okay, I'm going to have to learn how to interact with these emotions differently. You're highlighting the biggest point. Typically, we're impulsive. We're mindless. Uh, like when I have my kids, they're grown up now, but when they were younger and they'd hit each other, I'd be like, why'd you hit your brother? Well, he made me mad. And they would say that with justification. I play football too on Sundays. And when somebody does something that is outside the lines of competition, you're like, why'd you do that? Well, because he said something to me. And we would kind of be like, well, yeah, well, that makes sense. You got angry, you punch somebody. Well, that doesn't work in real life. <laughs> it doesn't work with my kids. It doesn't really work great on the football field. You know, there are penalties and there's consequences. But, but we understand that, well, if I have this emotion, of course I would respond this way. But I like to say, I'm like, if you go up and you punch Mike Tyson, you probably expect to get punched back. But if you go up and you, you punch Gandhi, you're going to get forgiveness. So it really isn't an automatic. It's, it's a matter of the individual needs to choose. And here's a big thing that I do with my clients as well. Well, who is it that I want to be? What's the character? What are the values that I want to emulate? And I think both Mike Tyson and Gandhi would be happy with the response because Mike Tyson values you know, self-defense and you know, strength and boundaries. And you just don't do this. If you do, I'm going to punish you. And Gandhi says, I value something else. And so he chooses his response differently. But what you were saying, Andres, which is great, was that there is that space between I have an emotion and then I have to choose my reaction. And this is where my work is with my clients. In my Success Stories community, I have a coaching uh, community where this is the big, big part of it. Things like mindfulness, where you kind of notice in that space, how can I settle there for a little bit longer? And instead of acting impulsively, check in with what's important to me, the reaction that I want to take, and then enact those behaviors that reflect that value. That's where the training comes in. It's not easy, but it's certainly possible. I like what you said about Gandhi and, and Mike Tyson. It sort of brought to mind that there is no, or I mean, what I've realized is there is no negative emotion and there is no negative reaction as long as they're congruent with the type of person that you want to be. I would take it even a step further before we evaluate the negative emotions. If you feel a certain way, you feel a certain way. Like I get jealous and I hate being jealous. It's not, it's not Christian. It's like, it's sinful. If you want to throw it in there, it, it doesn't help. It's unhelpful. It makes me feel bad. And I wish I could get rid of it. But why am I jealous? Well, because I live in the world and I've been on social media and I, I, I see like one of the funniest things is I, I, I grew up in the Bronx and I went to high school with Puff Daddy, Sean Combs. I ran track with him and I couldn't buy that guy's record for the first two years because I'm like, it's Sean. Why is everybody freaking out? Like, <laughs> like and again, he's very talented. But I couldn't get, I couldn't see Puff Daddy. I saw the guy I went to high school with and ran track with. Again, he was also fast, so, but he made it. And I hated the jealousy because I'm like, I was a normal human being and he's this great achievement thing. And I didn't like those feelings. And so, I, but I couldn't control the feelings. Like if I'm mad at my kids, I don't like to be mad at my kids. I, like I have a lot of feelings that I don't like, but they're there. Because we're, if you want to stay in the spiritual world, we're broken human beings. But if you want to say, because I have got goals, because, you know, they're able to do things that I wanted. Like, I'm also jealous of, you know, like every quarterback, Josh Allen in the NFL. Like, I'd love to be him too. <laughs> you know, it's like, but of course we want all of those things. There's nothing. What do we do with those emotions? That's really where we have the responsibility. So even if you're angry at the person you love the most, or you're jealous, or you're you know, we've also been hurt in our childhoods in the way that we grew up. So we, we get triggered in certain ways. So I, I really don't want any blame on anybody feeling like they, they're wrong for feeling something. 
But then just question, is this feeling helping me or hurting me? Is my response to it, am I responding in a way that moves me closer or further away? If I'm really jealous, let's say we're in a dating relationship. I'll just pull things out of the air. We're in a dating relationship where we're really super jealous and suspicious because we've been cheated on maybe two or three times or we're insecure about ourselves. But for whatever reason, we're, we're really jealous of our partner. If our partner is not doing anything wrong, but I'm now being more restrictive and, and checking her phone and you know telling her that she's looking at the lifeguard too long or whatever else that I might be doing, that's not really helping the relationship and it's going to go away. Now, I have every right to be jealous. Again, let's say I was cheated on two, three times and hopefully she would understand that. But then I need to own and say, I'm not seeing anything in her that's making me jealous. She's not flirting with the lifeguard. She's not texting other people. It's, it's me. This is my stuff. I'm not bad for feeling jealous, but I also want to be a loving, committed partner to this, to this person. So how should I respond to this? Maybe I can then take that jealousy and respond in a way and say, hey, honey, I'm feeling a little bit scared. Can, you know, I need some reassurance. Can you understand where I'm coming from? As opposed to grabbing her phone and blaming her for doing stuff. It's that space that you put together, you know, that you mentioned so much earlier. The more I can be more self-aware of the emotions have some self-compassion for myself and understand that I'm like this for a reason. It's a weakness. You know, it's not, I'm not proud of it. And then what do I do to become more secure? And I'll, like, you might guess that there's a little bit of truth in everything that I've been saying here. I've been completely making it up. But what I had done in my past was with, with my partner, I was like, can I look in your eyes as you tell me the truth? And I used to say, just let me marinate. Like, I know you're not lying to me. She's never, ever lied to me. 10 years. We're getting married in two months. Never, ever lied to me. And it took me a while to just, she would let me marinate. She would then try to reassure me. And I'd be like, no, no, shh. Like, I got to do this work. I'm scared. And I would look in her eyes and my head would be like, she's lying. It's this. Watch out for that. And I would just like say, no, I don't see that. This mindful exercise. And over time, that, that changed. But you take responsibility for your actions. Thank you for letting me have this therapy session. <laughs> No, it's funny that you say that actually, because I forget where I read it, but basically that marinating that you're talking about is actually something that is more inclined towards males, as in men. Uh, I think men are more inclined towards marinating and having to process things a little bit slower than, than women. And so then they get frustrated because they can sort of do that on the fly and, and they, they sort of, maybe they're more in tune with their emotions, right? So, uh. And we're more trained to resist them rather than be in tune with them. So we, we need time to let it seep in. Um, so I think there's probably a lot of guys listening that, that can um, relate. Well, let me jump in. I, I have no idea about the science on gender, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you. But what I will say is that I did get that from, and I wish I could remember the book. But what you're tuning into, and I imagine women would go through this too, is that we automatically and instinctively process negative stuff. Like if I touch the stove and it's hot, I remember that for the rest of my life. You know, when I get hurt in life, I remember it, I process it right away. If somebody calls me an idiot, it hits me and it sticks like Velcro and I, I feel it right away. But I don't know if the people out there, when I'm complimented, they say, hey, Eddie, that was a great podcast. You did really great with this client. You're this, you're that. It kind of bounces off like Teflon. It slides off. It, it doesn't really come in. And the reason is because biologically, the good stuff doesn't necessarily protect us in the same way that knowing the negative. I have to know and instantly process and internalize the negative because it's a danger. I don't have time. So we have to intentionally marinate in the good stuff because it doesn't have that same survival value. Now, it's, it's important for other things to be happy and to have good marriages and to succeed in sports and in life. Like you need to marinate in the good stuff because you need time for your brain to process it and move it into that longer term memory. And you have to be intentional about it. So when somebody pays you a compliment and you shuffle it off, when it, again, practical tips you had asked for, marinate, guy or girl, I don't care who you are. But when somebody says that you did something really well and you're like, okay, yeah, thanks. But you start to go into the negativity bias that we have, pause. Look at their face and how much you've helped them. Or look at how excited and just take the objective facts that that, that business idea that you have, they, they really see potential in that. Notice that your head is screaming all the negativity and imposter syndrome and all this other stuff. Notice that that's just your biology, but tune into the person in front of you, marinate in it, 
and just accept. It doesn't have to mean anything else. It doesn't mean that you're going to be successful. It doesn't mean that you're great. It just means that in this moment, the person in front of me loves this idea. And let that settle in. And watch what it, what it changes for you. That sort of, that, that sort of made me, uh, rem- it sort of reminded me of that old thing about how, you know, men will remember a compliment for the rest of their lives because we get so few. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But, but no, it's true. I mean, I think we, it's like, it's like fighting against a a evolutionarily useful tool that doesn't make sense in modern society. Um, and I think that goes for a lot of things in, in, in today's world, right? I mean, we live completely different than we lived just a thousand or what, maybe even a hundred years ago. So it, it's a little bit like we have to fight back to these internal um, pr- propensities, right? Uh, it's it, it's not always in our benefit anymore. So, yeah, and I, I'm always hesitant. Like another big thing I do with clients is like we want to start dropping the struggle to control, like controlling our feelings, controlling our thoughts. Because anytime we're doing that, we're 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 wrestling with these internal experiences. We can't also do things at the same time. Like a quick story, I was working with a hockey team, and they were just getting pushed around and understandably so the refs weren't really calling things. They were getting kind of beat up and they were losing three, nothing in the first period. And the coach turns to me, he goes, what am I supposed to say to these people, to these kids? And I was like, well, tell them that they either get mad and fight or they can get mad and play hockey. And this is based on some other stuff that we had talked about. He goes, okay. So he goes in and he gives this wonderful Disney speech and they come out. And in the first 20 seconds, they score their first goal in the first Minute and 15 seconds, they score their second goal. And within the first four minutes, they score their third goal to tie it up and they end up winning the game 6-4. And then I got the game puck at the end, which was cool. But (laughs) but really what that illustrated was that as long as they kept fighting with their emotions and listening to their emotions, and if they felt justified, and in fact they were, they had every right to be mad, and it wasn't helpful. So could they drop that struggle to control those things, accept what was, because their value and their goal at that moment was to score more than the other team? And could they bring their attention back to their reactions, as we had said? But it, that idea of fighting it, no, it's really much more a matter of letting it be and opening up around it and being willing to feel the crap in this life that we have to feel in service of where we want to go. It's that clarity of thinking of what's really important to me. And the willingness to feel, like pur- I like to say, purpose in my pain. I don't just don't suffer because you're just suffering for no reason. By all means, change. But just like if I'm going to be training for a marathon and that that 20 mile workout, it hurts. I don't like it, and I'm going to do it because it's going to m- prepare me for race day. We have lots of examples that we could do that in all areas of our life. Yeah, it reminds me. I mean, you know, like I've been angry. And then I go to the gym and lift more than I did, you know, ever, or, you know, set a new PR or like a mother that breaks a, a door, a, a car door to get into save their baby or something like that, right? Like there are times where it's useful, but at the same time, you don't, that's not like a good way to live your entire life. So there needs to be a, a better solution, right? To, to, to have, to be more productive or to be more efficient. So. Well, again, that's a great point. It's like if you happen to be angry and your response to it moves you in the right direction, then by all means do it. But you bring up a good point. So then does that mean that I need to generate a lot more anger in my life so I can work out well at the gym? And it's like, well, maybe in moments, but as a lifestyle, that might be difficult. You know, like it might, you know, if I'm going to keep thinking about how I've got a constant chip on my shoulder, for example, you hear a lot of high pro athletes that that say that that motivates them. And they're in the NFL and then boxing and everything else. And it's like, well, it's working. It's like, okay, well, I'd like to talk to them. And, and if I were working with them, I'd say, well, how's it affecting the rest of your life? Are you angry with your kids then as a result because you have this chip on your shoulder? Or do you think everybody's out to get you? Are you isolating your teammates? And you'll find for a lot of these athletes where it's working in one area, it's poison in another. So we would maybe kind of explore and say, can we be, here's a fancy word, more contextually intelligent about it. Like I can use it here but not there. So a weightlifting example, a great one. Uh, this was just like three or four weeks ago. I too am in the gym. I'm a little bit flat. So I start cursing myself out and beating myself up, like telling myself to like stop being a this or that or the other thing. 
And a friend's like, well, gosh, aren't you a sports psychologist? Aren't you supposed to be positive? It's not like, well, listen, first of all, I'm saying it with loving kindness. I'm kicking my own ass because I know I've got more in me. So it's coming from a good place. And like you, I got myself agitated enough and jacked up enough to hit a PR. So it worked. So does that mean then I have to adopt and call myself an idiot the rest of my life? No, because if I kept doing that in other scenarios, and I've done that like on the football field this past Sunday when I dropped a football and it had the opposite effect. I felt depressed. My head went down. I felt bad about, you know, dropping it. I felt not good enough. Started thinking about other times that I had done it. So it worked in one area in the gym, but it didn't work on the football field. So what's right or what's wrong? Use it in the gym when it works. Don't use it on the football field when it doesn't. There's not a rule. Look at yourself in the moment that you're doing it and say, is it moving me towards where I want to go or is it moving me away? Let's drop the rules of the way that we need to think and feel and start to look at the function of what we're thinking and feeling. Oh, I'm so excited. Like, I want to say that again because this is like, write this down, friends. It's not right or wrong, should or shouldn't, positive or negative. Is this helping me get where I want to go or is it hurting me? And if you adopt that sentence, that's going to be the most practical thing I give you all day. If you adopt that sentence into evaluating your own thoughts and feelings, it'll change everything. So the consensus is that these four emotions, three of them being bad, none of them are, an, I guess, a negative thing, to put it that way. They're yeah, all and they're not bad either. They're just uncomfortable. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, again, and notice your language, right? I mean, we've all been conditioned. These are bad. These are broken. They're pathological. Um, but I really like to be happy. I don't like the other stuff. I'm like, yeah. Well, I mean, in just today in like social media world that we live in, you know, there's definitely a, sort of a missing, a feeling of missing out and thinking that we're supposed to be in the happy state 99 or 100% of the time, which is not a practical, uh, so or not, not, uh, a possible thing to achieve, right? So uh, the uh, the other three that you're saying are normal, and it, it sort of it's a it's a negative feedback loop where you know if you're feeling angry, you're feeling one of the other, you know, one of one of these three, then you sort of chastise yourself worse than you would chastise somebody else, actually, and um and it just puts you in a worse and worse spot. So it's just, I mean, there's a bit yeah. of a snowballing effect as well, right? Thank you for doubling back on this, because again, as much as we're talking about how to get past it, it's good to revisit to that 75% of what it means to be human. My friends, if somebody in your family dies, if you go through a divorce, you just lost $50,000 in an investment. Why shouldn't you be mad? Somebody cheats you, steals from you. Why shouldn't you be upset? Why shouldn't you be nervous about putting yourself in that situation again and doubting your future? Why shouldn't you be questioning whether you can do this or not? This is not pathology. And, and even at the highest end, like how sad you might be. You know, moments of depression. Like I don't want to get into the clinical aspect. Like if you have it for six months and you have suicidal thoughts and stuff, by all means. I mean, the, the strategies that we're talking about here can help influence that. But please get some help with that. I'm not saying that it's just normal and just deal with that. But as we kind of get back into the normal ups and downs, like you said, the, the unrealistic aspect that I should be happy all the time. And if I'm not, I'm not doing okay. It's bad. I have to challenge you to open up to allow yourself more feelings given how rough this world is, given the high goals that you have and the adversity that you need to go through in order to get there. Please create some space to be uncomfortable and continue to go back and say, how can I respond to this? The other big challenge is, is that we, our performance usually suffers when we prioritize our feelings over our actions. As I had said, my kids, they, they hit, you know, he made me mad, so I hit him. Well, I didn't go work out because I was tired. I didn't go and do this thing because I was scared. We use our emotions to justify our actions a lot. And that's where I think most people will get caught up. If you can learn to expand around it and use that helpful versus hurtful, can I be willing to do that anxious thing in service of moving my business forward? It becomes very, very different. We tend to get hooked up on, like, I want to get in shape, but I really want that cookie. Well, I give in because I've got these feelings. I got to get rid of this feeling in order to stick to my diet. No, 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 no. You have to learn how to be hungry and crave cookies and stay focused on what you want to be and be willing to suffer 
in service of that fitness goal. It's very, very different when we can start to take the power out of our feelings guiding us. We cannot let them be in charge. Our feelings are all over the board and our impulsivity as a result of it can be very dangerous. So what's your opinion on the stoic philosophy of just not being moved by your emotions? I mean, I feel like it's a little bit different than what you're saying, right? And there can be a negative side effect to not letting your emotions flow, if you will. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what your opinion on that is. Yeah, I'm a fan of the Stoicism. Um, they make a lot of great points. Um, as we get into 2024 and kind of say how it kind of goes in, I like to add that aspect of the functional utility. Like, I don't want it to be like, sometimes I think on the surface, and I don't think Stoicism says it don't have emotions. <laughs> but there really is, as I get from the Stoics, the idea of an acceptance of the negativity. It really, like, they've really nailed the part about, look, it's not about all being happy. Now, let's talk about happiness, though. Like I said, when you get it, I want you to enjoy it to the fullest. When you are jacked up about this project, when you are loving so much on your partner and you're just you're showering them with love and affection, then ride that wave because it's working. You know, I would also caution you and say, don't expect that to be the next seven years of your life. You know, not not to not to pop the bubble, but just to understand that we don't want to get too attached to any one emotion. And then this is where when we get really depressed or sad or anxious or something else too. Like this can be really helpful to realize no matter how bad it is right now, I know that this can't last either. I'm telling you, and my most depressed moments have passed. My most anxious moments no longer exist. My happiest moments have also ended. My angriest times I've gotten over. And I know all four of them are also coming later today. <laughs> yeah, something with anxiety that really helped me is the idea of um, I'm not okay, right? And and by that, I mean, there's a story, there was a story in my head saying that the way things are now are not okay, right? Um, and that's something that I worked on and sort of accepted that we are where we are, you know, the present, if you want to get sort of um, metaphysical a little bit you can you know there's only there is only the present um, but in reality I realized that you know and it's a little bit of like realizing that you're enough the way that you are in this present moment and there's nothing that you really need to change but I feel like that's quite a pervasive thing that I've noticed is that most people live their lives thinking that they're not okay or that the world isn't okay the way it is, or that it should be different. And I'm curious if that sort of ties into anything that you've worked with your athletes and, and in your anxiety work. Uh, it certainly does. Um, it ties in in so many different ways. I'm not sure which direction to take it. Um, let me maybe hit a couple of highlights and you tell me where you want to dive in. Um, I love the way you said, like, I, I tell myself this story. And that's a really helpful intervention that I do with my clients that we do have a mind that, as we had said, it's got this negativity bias that's got a protective mechanism to tell us what could go wrong all the time, to warn us, a survival instinct. So I like to kind of say that, you know, we've got, like, I've got Eddie, and I know what he thinks and what he loves and what he wants to do. But then I also have a, another person inside of me that will kind of shout out these things, my automatic thinking. You know, that, that one that was down on the football field that I talked about, that wasn't me. That wasn't Dr. Eddie being out there. That wasn't what I was choosing to do. It was my self-protective self. I have one client that, you know, big Batman fam, he, he called this part of his mind the Joker. It's like the antagonist. Now, as you know, with Batman and Joker, like Batman never ultimately beats Joker. Like he's been around for however long. You're never going to convince the Joker to be a good guy. And so why do we argue with him? You also can't put him away at Arkham Asylum. He keeps escaping. He keeps coming back. And so when you kind of start to realize that that's what it is and you kind of just accept the Joker for who he is, we can do that with our own self. And when they're telling you a story, you're going to believe the Joker? Really? If I've had to learn for myself my own story of I'm not good enough, a variation of what you were saying, I'm not good enough. 
Why is it so understand? How is that useful to, you know, is that, well, is that? Yeah, that's a great question. How it's, how it ends up being useful is, uh, as I understand it, like way back in cave person days, we really depended on being part of a tribe. Um, you could not survive alone. You needed a tribe and it was this cooperative community effort. And so if you were not liked in the community, if you got left out of the community, you, the, there was the threat of death. And so being accepted and wanting to belong, it's understood in circles that there's this evolutionary purpose. And so it looks a little bit different here, but at the same time, if you feel rejected by your family or your teammates and you're on the outside, it bothers us very much. So at the most basic level, we have to ask, am I good enough? Am I doing the right thing? Am I fast enough, strong enough? Do I have enough money? Do I look good enough? Am I smart enough? And then you start to do the comparisons. Now, we also have a community that on ESPN, we celebrate top plays of the week and who's the best and we have rankings. And so we're constantly being compared. And if we are doing well, we get reinforced with scholarships and pay raises. And so the whole world is all about comparison, social media, how many likes, you know, who's got a better following. So we're constantly been trained and bombarded. So that's where it all comes from. If like, I'm, I'm not good enough. Well, I'm not if I want to play in the NBA. I'm not if I want to run Google. I'm not if I want to. <laughs> like, so there's a lot of things that I'm not good enough. So it, it, it's, we're told that all the time. Every time I lose, every time I don't lift the heavier weight and I see somebody else that does it. So there's a certain amount of truth in it, but we start to internalize it and that's the problem. And then the, the positivity of just being, oh, yes, you are and you're fine the way you are. That, that bothers me and a lot of other people because it's like, but that's not really consistent with the world. So you have to find another way to kind of come terms with it. Like for me, it's in my Christian faith where I'm like, okay, I have to get out of this whole secular paradigm, which could be a whole nother podcast, but, but that helps me get there. But even if you want to take it from a functional standpoint, then the idea is, okay, look, none of us then are good enough because even LeBron James and Tom Brady and everybody else, they have things that aren't perfect about them and they've had difficulties in their lives. So let me just stop the comparison and say, let me look at my circle. I'm not good enough. Okay, then how do I get better? How do I eat better, sleep better, treat my kids better? How do I become a better podcast guest? Maybe it's talking less. Maybe I can work on that. <laughs> but, you know, you just get functional and it doesn't mean that then I'm worthless. And, and we have to be careful of the way our mind likes to label. Like if I want to think that I'm a good person, people are like, oh, yeah, you should do that. Oh, yeah, I've done good things but I've also done bad things. So then does that mean I should think I'm a bad person? Well, no, because I've also done good things. Maybe I'm neither. Maybe I'm both. Maybe having an evaluation doesn't freaking matter. Maybe it gets back to just do the right thing for the person in front of me. And that's where I end up settling. Like try to, I just try to drop the evaluations. They've become less and less useful in my life. The part that I still struggle with, if I'm honest, is... You know, I've, I've come to the realization, this realization, right? Like I'm fine the way they are. I am all these things. But then the part with anxiety that still gets to me is that I still have that need of knowing that things are going to be quote unquote, okay in the future. And there's no way of knowing that. And, you know, you can, I, I often say that you do need to have some sort of faith, whether it's, you know, religious faith or just faith. Uh, in the universe that something's gonna, that, that things are going to go your way. And, you know, the, the more I go along in my journey and the more I just set intention, the more things actually do come my way that are good things. Right. But, uh, but there's always that sort of feeling of like, what if, what if things don't go my way? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, to m my response to myself for that is like, what is your way? What is the way, right? There just is, is it is what it is, right? It is the way that it will result in, um, which, which, and I'm not saying that I'm not saying like a destiny argument here. I'm just saying it is what it is, right? Like it's going to be what it's going to be. Um, so I'm curious what your, what your advice would be for me in this yeah. case, because I'll, I'll be honest, that's something I struggle with. So yeah, no, thank you so much for asking that question. And for being vulnerable to be honest about this, because I know for a fact that almost everybody listening is waiting for this answer. So I'm going to first start off with that I believe you should be worried about your future in that way. 
It goes back to that first point that we had talked about. There's nothing wrong with you when you're saying, but I have this need to know that everything's going to turn out. Yeah, me too. Isn't that interesting? That we all really want that guarantee because we desire that safety. Now, that doesn't mean, look, it is what it is and then forget about it. That's where I want the shift for you and your listeners is I want you to embrace and respect that you care so much about your future and the world is tough. There are things that are going to go against you. You are going to have hardship coming up. I don't know what it's like, but you look pretty young. More stuff's coming. Yeah, I like, and I I like what you that. said that, that the, the athletes, the highest performing athletes were the most anxious people because uh, they care the most. And yeah. uh, that's a reassuring fact. <laughs> so here's part two. Once you settle into that, rather than going away from it, like you had said, then that allows you to pivot and say, okay, will you be okay if hard stuff happens? Now, I don't mean, again, to make you feel better, but rather to prepare you. What I've learned in my life is that I, for the most difficult things that I've been through, I've been through them and I've developed the sense that I don't want stuff to go wrong in my life or with my kids or in this new marriage or, you know, anything else. Like, I know there's going to be challenges and I know that I've built up strength and that I've got a drive that even if it goes bad, I will hate it and I will go through it. I don't like the idea of it. I'll be okay. It'll suck. I mean, we all just went through COVID. And if you're alive, that means you got through it. And I'm sure you don't want to go through it again. And I'm sure you were challenged in tremendous ways. And please know that you have some resilience. Again, this is not to make you feel better, but it's to settle down that anxiety. Well, what if this happens? And what if that happens? Well, I'm telling you, Andres, what's going to happen is you're going to be mad. You're going to be upset. You're going to lose some money. You're going to have some emotional heartache. And that's part of being human. And I'm sorry for that. And I anticipate that you'll double down and you will go through it and it won't last. Something that came to mind is it is part of being human, but at the same time, you know, you probably couldn't feel one emotion without the other. I don't know how that would sort of square into your four emotions because it seems unbalanced with, with the <laughs> three uh, negative ones or positive ones, right? But uh, but let's not like label them as positive or negative at this point, right? We've learned. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's sort of a yin and yang thing, right? Like you couldn't feel love if you didn't... Um, Maybe yeah. experience the lack thereof, but uh, yeah, or experience anger, right? So, and that's what's pretty amazing about the mindfulness space when you can kind of get into it. And to your point, how we're always evaluating that there is no good without bad, pretty without ugly, you know, you could go on. And once we kind of categorize it, we do really introduce the other side of it. And when these evaluations are helpful, we use them. Do I like what I'm eating? Is it, you know, am I comfortable in this? You know, so it's, oh, I'm not against evaluations, but there really is more of this descriptive mindset that I encourage my performers to get into. You know, am I good or bad? Do I suck or am I fantastic? Am I this or am I that? Well, what is that serving when you have to hit the ball? Like, can we get out of the evaluation standpoint and say, I just need to look at the release of the pitch? You know, oh, I'm fat or I'm in shape. Okay, well, either way, I've got to do these 10 burpees. Let me focus on the form. So that might be another way that could be helpful for the listeners that if you're getting all caught up in the evaluations, good or bad, it doesn't matter. I mean, you've heard people that go in and they're super confident, they're really positive, and then they go in and they get their ass kicked because they're overconfident. So it's another way of kind of saying, look, if evaluations aren't serving you, just get back to what you need to do. And if the emotions and the evaluations are serving you, then ride the wave. But it's nice to tie this back, a beautiful question on your part to kind of say, well, well, let me go back. Is this helpful or hurtful? Is it moving me towards who I want to be or away? I want to keep grounding you in that vision, which another point that we can maybe talk about is having really a clarity of who it is that you want to be. What are the values that are driving you? Not necessarily I want to make $2 million or I want to be a, a world champion. Like those are goals, but the why and the purpose, what's the character, the how that you want to live your life in order to get there? Honesty, curiosity, adventure, safety, security. I found that all my human beings that I've worked with, performers and non-performers alike, when they're tied into those values and they have a clarity of what it is that they want to do, they can bring that into every situation and live their truest selves. 
something I've realized as well is, you know, in the moment, sometimes things are negative, but in the long term, they can be positive. So it's sort of useless to sort of to uh, to assign meaning uh, in the moment of like, oh, I did that, that, you know, I did I did great right there, or I did horrible. Um, and you don't, and like you're saying, you don't really give yourself a middle ground, so that doesn't really help anybody. But in the short term, but yeah, I want to um, I want to ask about making mistakes. Uh, something that I've noticed that really people struggle with is getting out of their own way right and being willing to make mistakes um oftentimes the performing the performance anxiety or the perceived lack of action you know when people just aren't moving forward uh with their goals uh it's often they just don't want to make a mistake and something that I've noticed with me, which I feel like is this, the next level of it is, um, you know, once you get past making, you know, getting over making mistakes is, um, we're just accepting the fact that to learn a new skill, you're going to have to make a bunch of mistakes before you're good at doing it and realizing that that's okay. Right. I mean, I was just talking about this yesterday where I was trying to make more content for my e-commerce brand and i was like oh i need i need somebody that to help me do this uh, i'm not good at this right and i sat down yesterday and i was like you know what before i do that i'm going to give myself opportunity to make five posts or something like that and one i had a blast doing it because they're all pretty sort of uh comedic type posts uh -huh. uh, and and second of all you know i learned a few a few skills and then um, realize like, Hey, I'm not, I'm not so bad at it. I just need to learn how to do this. And that's going to create, and that's going to take some making mistakes. And to that point, uh, I posted everything regardless because, uh, even if it wasn't perfect, because, you know, uh, perfection, uh, is the, the enemy of entrepreneurship in my opinion, or one of them at least, <laughs> but I'm, I'm dragging on. So <laughs> if you wanted to, to give, give your opinion on that, yeah. Yeah, so for those that are listening, you, I, I heard your your mood change as you kind of went through it. So everything you said is exactly right. So the philosophy that you have in your head is that you you got to learn how to accept the mistakes and move on. I find that the challenge with my clients is that everybody knows it and they've been told that, and there are two problems with it. One is it's as if you can't let it bother you anymore. And that's where the problem becomes is because as a perfectionist, you're always going to be bothered. So to post it did exactly how I'd like it to be. Yeah. Right. And I encourage you to still hold on to that. Like that's where the perfectionists struggle because we want to let them, we want to make our perfectionists when they're being talked to say that mistakes are okay. And they're not mistakes hurt business. Mistakes hurt other people. So never tell a perfectionist it's okay to make a mistake. You'll lose, you'll lose anything. You'll never be able to talk Attention. to me. Yeah, thank you. So so that's the part one, is that with part two here, it, it goes along with it. So how do I not prioritize feeling better? Because that's what you were saying is like, if this perfectionism is it and I have to change how I feel about the mistakes in order to move forward, then you're going to stay stuck. Because as a perfectionist, you're never going to be okay with it. And I'm telling you, I don't want any of the perfectionists out there to be okay with subpar performances. The world's quality will go down if we don't keep raising the bar. So it's this idea of expanding around that crappy feeling that you had. That's where you really succeeded is if you're changing and you're saying, okay, I am going to not like these mistakes and I'm willing to feel this crap and make the mistakes and put it out and post it before I'm comfortable in service of moving forward. The mistakes, let's take it another step. If I'm not making mistakes, we have to get to the point that means that I'm not pushing myself further. If I make no more mistakes in my life, my growth immediately stops. I have young kids who are upset in Little League about making mistakes. 
Isn't that a shame? Because they're not in the major leagues yet. <laughs> they have a lot more to do. And I'm talking about, well, then what about high school? And then what about college? And then what about the minor leagues? And then what about the pros that are still upset about making mistakes? Because I'm a pro and I shouldn't make a mistake now. Yeah, but you haven't gotten to the Pro Bowl yet. You haven't gotten, you haven't won gold medal yet. Oh, and you've won gold medal? Well, you haven't broken the world record. Like the idea is that we could always improve. And mistakes, and you all know this, inform where I went wrong. My mistakes tell me what I did that didn't work. This is how you learned how to walk. You didn't watch your parents for two years and then pop up and just walk beautifully. This is how you learned to ride a bike. You fell and you lost balance and you had to practice it and make mistakes in serving how to write it. You didn't read a book or watch a YouTube video on how to swim. You jumped in the water and you swallowed a lot of water. So why would that be any difference in your marriage, in your fitness journey, in your, in your sport development, in your business that you've never done before or you've never taken to that six-figure level or seven-figure level? You have to make those mistakes along the way. And they suck completely. And I don't want you to feel good about them. But if you're intolerant of them, then you're not going to grow because it's in that space of making mistakes that your growth occurs. And so if you can emotionally come to terms with that and be willing to feel bad as you do it in service of the, of the greatness that you can achieve, that's where you're freed up a little bit more. But you may never feel good about it. And I hope that you can be okay with that. Well, that's definitely the biggest takeaway for today for me. I don't know about the listeners, but <laughs> so we're going to have to end it here. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Eddie, for jumping on. It was uh, enlightening uh, and uh, hopefully we can stay in touch. And, and yeah, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. And if people have liked, I have a gift for you. Um, if you go to DrEddieOConnor.com, I've got a free training video for you um, called What to Do When Positive Thinking Doesn't Work. So if you've really enjoyed what we've talked about on this podcast about, oh gosh, I have to be positive and you know, fighting and struggling with your own thoughts, feelings, and emotions, it's a nice brief 20-minute deeper dive that will really teach you how to learn how to let go a little bit and again, understand what the usefulness of your anxiety, why it's there, but maybe even more importantly, how to unhook from it so that you can be freed up to do what's important now. So again, it's my website, drreadyoconnor.com. It's free. Just put in your email and we'll get it to you right away. Beautiful. Well, at the very least, hopefully the listeners know that they're not alone in all of this. Absolutely. It happens to us all. Thanks again. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs>